From New York City for our viewers worldwide, I'm Shanali Basic, and Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, a hot payrolls number is met with cool wages. And the report spurs investors to lock in that June Fed rate cut. And with all the focus on the Fed, credit issuance sets another record. But we begin with the big issue. Fed watchers soak in the data. This is a, an ambiguous report. Generally a positive story. The labor market's doing fine. Jobs numbers have exceeded expectations consistently. The economy is still good. This economy is really not nearly as fragile as people think. Labor market holding up. The market, however, will interpret this as good news. The soft landing is fully priced in. You gotta take the Fed at its word that three cuts is probably the likely place. I think the Fed's in a little bit of a pickle here. It's still a solid economy, but it's moderating. I think they want to cut rates. I think it's a matter of when, not if at this point. Yeah, we're thinking the Fed can, can orchestrate this soft landing, but they do have to cut. Now let's start with a look at those jobs numbers because I think you could call this the best of both worlds here. The non-farm payrolls report now posting a 275 a gain where you saw 200,000 expected. Now what does that mean in terms of the rest of the data here? Because you did see weaker data elsewhere even if that headline number had beaten expectations and that is in the unemployment rate for starters. There was an expected to be a 3.7 rate here but you had it tick higher to 3.9 percent. And in addition to that you also saw some weakness in average hourly earnings month over month changes. The expectation here was two tenths of 1% higher and you're getting it in at one tenth of 1% higher. And remember wages, where, where there were a lot of investors concerned about whether wages going higher would also increase that pace of inflation. Now let's flip up the board here and look at the market reactions because you have seen the market react meaningfully, meaningfully now below 450 on that two year yield down now to about 447 on the day, a two basis point move after that payrolls report that you're seeing. But you have seen a major drift here over the last couple of weeks. You saw this week alone some reaction to the Fed Chair Powell's testimony to Congress drifting lower. But remember, two weeks ago, we were still above 470 on that two year yield. And of course, expectations for that June rate cut all but in the bag when you look at Fed futures. Now, Fed Chair Jay Powell spoke this week in front of Congress and says the bank is indeed getting closer to cutting. I think we're in the right place, which is we're waiting to see, we're waiting to become more confident that inflation is moving sustainably at 2%. Mm -hmm. When we do get that confidence and we're not far from it, it'll be appropriate to begin to dial back the level of restriction so that we don't, you know, drive the economy into recession rather than normalizing policy as the economy gets back to normal. Now joining us now is BlackRock Scarthy Chowdhury and Martin Norton of Morningstar Wealth. And both of you, thank you for joining me on this very busy day. Gargi, when you looked at the data coming in this morning and you saw that the expectations for that June rate cut just got so much higher, what do you have still in terms of any note of caution for any rate cuts beyond that? Sure. Uh, Shanali, it's so great to be here. Happy International Women's Day to you and everyone listening. Um, as I was following the data and watching the market reaction to it, the first thing I would say is this was unambiguously a great piece of data for the Fed. When we look at the combination of that moderating job growth and decelerating wages, that is nirvana. That's exactly what they want to see. And the cues for the equity and bond markets are that things are well and both should continue to do well. I think when I ask also about that, uh, that two year part of the curve in mm -hmm. particular, Marta, are you seeing the potential for more buying given how far yields have come down, given the rate cut expectations now increasing? Yeah, well, um, our fair value for the two year is really around 3.12 or so. So even though the two year has come down, it's still above our fair value. And we think it's still a reasonable, you know, piece to have in your overall portfolio. And I think as we start to see the markets continue to gain confidence, you know, Powell was so interesting in what he said, because he said, you know, they're waiting to gain confidence and they're not far off gaining that confidence. So I think as that becomes more entrenched in investor psyche, I think we can start to see the two year move further um, lower. And so that's, you know, more returns for investors. And Gargi, how do you think about not just the two year, but even further out on the curve here? You did see some movement in the 10 year, for example, mm -hmm. but there's still a little uncertainty out there. 
Yeah, of course. I think where investors want to be moving towards, and actually that's what we're finding in fund flows, is really that intermediate part of the curve. So investors moving to something like the ag, investors moving to that belly of the curve, that is where you're earning the most amount of duration as well as coupon. I think as you look out further past the seven-year point, if you're looking at 10s, 20s, 30s, I think there can be expectation of further steepening. We've begun to see a little bit of that. I think that can continue. I think there's a lot of supply to contend with even you know later this month of course and I think that investors are better off right now given the strength of the economic data given that there's so much uh, questions about the decelerating path of inflation you want to clip your coupon you want to do that in the intermediate part of the curve and you want to do that in very selective active funds uh, within the high yield and IG and EM space as well now Marta how important for you is it not just to see that June rate cut but further ones this year you have Neil Kashkari, for example, saying that you could see two rate cuts, maybe just one rate cut this year. Do you think that the market really needs more than that? Well, our expectation is for the economy to slow. Now, of course, it's been very strong um, and it continues to prove its strength. Um, but as we start to see the effect of these higher um, rates, as we start to see the consumer maybe um, find that the excess savings really aren't there the way it ha they have been for the past few years, I think we are going to start to see the economy slow. And I think inflation will follow suit. So I think there's space to argue for more rate cuts over the course of this year. But of course, that's the ambiguity. And that's why we have to have a wider you know, confidence in a role around our expectations and kind of plan for a variety of different scenarios. I think, Argy, you have to ask yourself when you see a little bit of weakening in the data finally, when you look at payrolls today uh, and unemployment in particular, in wages, when do you see further softening? How closely are you watching for something that is such a gentle landing mm -hmm. to potentially turn into something more severe? Yeah, I think we're far away from that. And I would hesitate to call the data today any signal of softening. Yes, the unemployment rate did pick up, but that was on the back of participation rate picking up, especially for prime age women. That went back up to 77.7%. That is an excellent sign. So I wouldn't be too nervous. Now, you know, to your question, where should we look for weakening in terms of the economy? I think looking at the, the strength of the consumer and to what extent is the consumer feeling a little bit more nervous about their spending habits. So sort of looking at these indicators of wages, looking at some of the delinquency rates for credit cards and auto loans, looking at retail sales data. I think that is where I'm going to focus as it pertains to weakness, but nothing so far, certainly not today's data data makes us concerned about moderation, slowdown, but certainly not something that resembles a hard landing at all. Now, Marta, also next week we have, in addition to this payroll report that we got today, we have next week inflation data. Where are you going to be looking for signs of inflation that still may be running too hot? Yeah. So with inflation, you know, we have seen a lot of moderation on the good side, but of course it's the services side that Powell and others are noticing that there's been this sticky inflation. And interestingly in the services, it's really coming down to housing. And so we want to be watching the housing market really closely. When we take a look at those knife edge leading indicators of housing, a lot comes down to market rents. Um, and we're seeing those market rents start to come down. You know, there was an acceleration in 2021 and 2022 but the expectation is that those are coming down and the housing market is cooling. And I think as we start to see that housing data, that cooling data start to filter through the index, we can start to see the broader index, you know, behave the way we'd like. Now, just real quick on the PCE, because I think there's this expectation or thought that year over year, the numbers are still quite high. But if we're looking at monthly prints on a six month basis for the PCE deflator for the back half of last year, that was really around 2.3%. So not that far off the Fed's target. So our expectation Expectation. Of course, there's volatility print to print, but our expectation is that we'll start to see those, those lower numbers show up in the year-over-year -year numbers as well. How are you looking at the inflation data, Gargi? Because on one hand, even if you've got positive data, there is a worry about re-acceleration re of inflation that's under the surface. So does next week's print uh, give you more certainty, not just for June, but potentially that second rate mm -hmm. cut this year? Absolutely. So I think for next week, very important data for the markets, especially given that strength in the January print. Uh, to Marta's excellent points, obviously the shelter inflation component will be really important. 
uh, and the wedge between that rent and the owner's equivalent rent. And if that continues to move in two different directions, that's something I'll be looking at. But the other thing is the super core measure. Now, this is something that we've all been obsessed with, looking at inflation X of that services, uh, sorry, the shelter measure. If that continues to move higher, I think that's another concern for the Fed. Now, our view is that the January print was related to residual seasonality. It wasn't a signal for continued reacceleration. But of course, we have to see what February brings. To Marta's point again, PCE moving down, the six-month annualized and the three-month annualized being a lot closer to the Fed's target of 2% is very, very reassuring. But we just have to make sure that that greater confidence that Chair Powell needs is available via super core continuing to move down. You know, under the surface also, Chair Powell got a lot of questions about balance sheet reduction mm -hmm. and the life support that still might be adding to the market. How difficult would it be for him to reduce that balance sheet? How do you feel about that and on the uncertainty, Gargi, that that would create on the longer end of the curve? Yeah, I think, you know, this is where I take a lot of signals from Waller and Lori Logan and they have spoken about this. Obviously, at some point, the QT unwind is going to very much be in the forefront of our minds. I think that the Fed has already done and will continue to do a transparent job in terms of talking about monetary policy as it pertains to Fed funds and then the balance sheet policy as it pertains to QT. And I think that's what I'm watching for and certainly reading everything that comes out from Laurie Logan and the Dallas Fed in terms of how we should think about uh, the timing of that. We heard from Chair Powell in the last FOMC meeting that they'll discuss it deeper in March. So we can't wait for that to hear what deeper discussions were had. And of course, the other thing that we haven't talked about yet is that the uh, you know we're going to get new FOMC dots. Uh, all eyes are focused on that expectation. Uh, it's pretty unstable with two numbers or two people needing to uh, move the dots for that to move lower. And I think the CPI data will be very important for indicators of where that ends up. Martin Northen of Morningstar Wealth and BlackRock's Gargi Chowdhury. We have to leave it there, but again, critical data next week after some critical data today. Now, up next, the auction block. We're looking at high-grade U.S. sales off to the fastest start to any year on record, with over $430 billion already priced in. We're going to dig into that bond binge up next. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Shanali Basak, and this is Bloomberg Real Yield. And it's time now for the auction block, where U.S. investment-grade issuance stayed hot. Weekly sales exceeding $50 billion for the third straight week. And for the notable offerings, they included Barclays, BlackRock, and the Bank of New York Mellon. And as I mentioned earlier, sales are now around 30% higher than they were this time in 2023. And they're on record pace to start the year. And over in U.S. high yield, the week's sales totaled over $7.5 billion. Alcoa, Xerox, and Clear Channel helped drive the year-to-date total to more than $65 billion. And outside of the United States, Israel sold $8 billion of international bonds, the nation's biggest sale of dollar notes on record. The government issued the debt in three parts and at least reeled in $34 billion worth of investor demand. And when it comes to credit and fixed income, Oak Tree's Howard Marks weighed in on the rate backdrop for today's investors. Today's rates are not high historically, but they're certainly higher than we had from 09 through 21, which means the returns on credit investing, fixed income investing, bond investing, loan investing, will be higher than those in that period, which were, you know, really uh, paltry. Joining us now to discuss this is Winnie Cesar of Credit Sites and Maureen O'Connor of Wells Fargo. Maureen, we started talking about the issuance deluge that we've seen at the beginning of this year. And as you see kind of the economic data really appease investors here, what does the issuance calendar start to look like over the next couple months? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think the conditions in our market really have never been better, at least in the last 24 months, to issue debt. Um, and while we're not at the lowest coupons, we're sitting at effectively the two-year tights and spreads. And so if you're a borrower that buys into the narrative that at some point we'll be up against some economic slowdown, perhaps in the back half of the year, that should put some pressure on spreads fundamentally, then no better time now to de-risk your funding plans and get something done. And that is why, indeed, we are looking at probably our, our busiest ever first quarter uh, in terms of investment 
investment grade issuance. And our expectation is that likely continues at least through the, the first half of the year. There are some unknowns in the second half of the year, right? We're heading into an election cycle. Obviously, it's going to be tricky navigating this uh, new um, uh, monetary policy regime. Um, but at least for now, borrowers are finding an opportunity to tap into what are exceptionally strong demand dynamics. Um, in our opinion, is so long as the market holds up over the course of the next couple of months, uh, it will likely still be an active market, perhaps not quite as active as we started the year, as we've seen a little bit of a pull forward, I think, on our pipeline. Um, but no question about it, um, the conditions could not be more supportive than they are right now. Now, it's interesting, Winnie, we were talking to Maureen just now about this idea of tight spreads. If you look at high grade and even riskier parts of the market, how much are investors really being compensated here for what they're taking on? So on a spread basis, objectively, not that much. But back to that all-in yield environment that Howard Marks was talking about. And I think that a lot of investors are still looking at yields over 5% for investment grade, close to 8% for high yield and saying, you know, maybe we can live with a little bit tighter spread given that we do have stronger projected forward returns with these elevated yields. Now, Winnie, on that note as well, when you think about uh, what you're getting for your dollars here in the riskier parts of the market, do you have any concerns given how strong the economy is about some of the riskier types of debt, higher yielding debt? So I think that I would be a terrible strategist if I didn't have any concerns. But one thing that we've observed is that the really distressed part of the high yield market especially has been fairly stable over the past two years at this point. We had a pretty significant blow up back in July of 2022 as people started to be concerned about higher for longer and the potential for a recession. And since then, we've seen some recovery in the distressed market, but there's definitely that specific cohort of issuers where capital structures are just not going to work long term. So there are still idiosyncratic factors at play. But when we look at the kind of going concern triple C's, the better uh, quality single B's, that part of the market actually looks fairly compelling. What about, Maureen, your conversations that you're having with your uh, rivals there or co our colleagues there on the uh, higher yields in, uh, versus investment grade underwriting space? Do you find that there is so much investor demand for credit right now that they are just putting all that dollar to work? Or are they taking pause in some areas? Uh, well, I think if you look at just the immediate market environment, we've obviously pushed almost $450 billion of volume through our market. So we are seeing a little bit more price discipline around the edges. I would count, couch that as kind of just indigestion, market indigestion. I think it will be reasonably short-lived because to Winnie's point, I think elevated yields are going to continue to attract dollars into our market. Um, but to the extent we move past that over a, a couple of maybe quiet weeks for volume, um, ultimately, I think the trade that investors are most focused on this year is still in beta compression. Um, and you can see that in an investment grade in the way that triple B's have compressed to single A's over the course of the last 12 to 18 months. And you're definitely seeing that in compression from high yield into investment grade as well. So a willingness for investors to reach further down the rating spectrum and further down the capital stack. You've seen a resurgence in some of these hybrid capital securities as well, really in an attempt to pick up additional yield, given that we've priced in, you know, this uh, effectively perfect soft landing outcome here for the economy. You know, we're looking also tied to jobs data on one hand, even though we're seeing people bringing in jobs, we are seeing wages starting to moderate, Winnie. We are seeing, uh, also, the unemployment rate took a little higher. And we're also seeing that consumers are largely stuck with a ton of credit card debt. And so if you look at kind of the consumer leverage sectors here, do you have any concern when it comes to the consumer? So I do think that the consumer is going to start to normalize behavior. You know, as you noted, we've seen a tick up in credit card debt. We've seen a tick up in delinquencies. When we talked to our financial team, who has been very focused on a lot of these consumer debt components, they're really pointing to the normalization in consumer behavior. We had a couple of years with so much fiscal stimulus, so much of a defensive consumer trade with not a lot of spending going on, that these delinquency rates and credit card debt, there was a significant pay down. And now as the economy has come back online, consumers are spending again, it makes sense that you would start to see increases in delinquencies, increases in credit card debt. And now we're looking for kind of the, the plateau in that increase and start to see a stabilization in that trend, which is what our financial team is looking for. So we do think that the consumer is going to slow down. We are monitoring the consumer debt balances, but we're not so concerned about them quite yet. Now, Maureen, are there sectors being left out of the rally? 
Um, and investment grade, it feels pretty widespread. Um, clearly, there are some focuses on maybe in the media space, some falling angels, uh, potentials that are, are playing out there. But I would highlight that, um, you know, there have been more upgrades than downgrades to start the year, for sure, from a rating agency's perspective. So fundamentally, I think credit's in pretty sound shape. So it has been pretty widespread, obviously, with some, you know, kind of idiosyncratic um, issues underlying some, some subsectors within maybe media. But uh, beyond that, um, you know, I think our market, um, you know, it, like I said, is, is trading at, at two-year tights. It doesn't have a huge amount more to run, but there are pockets of opportunity, names that were perhaps more heavily impacted through the COVID years that are still coming there, coming you know uh, up again uh, in the rating spectrum. Um, so I think investors are finding some value there for sure um, in names that you know perhaps didn't participate in the rally perhaps over the last 12 to 18 months, but are certainly enjoying that um, that tailwind now. Last sector to ask you about, Winnie here. How do you feel about financials and and credit mm -hmm. tied to financial companies, given all that we've seen happen this week uh, in the regional banking sector with NYCB? Yeah, so we're still pretty positive on financials as a whole. We do think that amid a persistently flat to inverted treasury curve that you're going to continue to see some of the challenges in, in the smaller banks, especially as we continue to better understand where commercial real estate is going and, and some of the other asset impairments that we are going to ultimately see for the cycle. We don't think it's widespread. We don't think it's systemic. And really for investment grade spreads to reach new cyclical types, we'll have to see financials really drive a big part of that movement. Winnie Caesar of Credit Size and Maureen O'Connor of Wells Fargo. Certainly the market getting all the more interesting and still ahead. Stick with us. We're going to do the final spread. The week ahead, another key inflation print on deck. Big data ahead. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Shanali Basak, and this is Bloomberg Real Yield. And it's time now for the final spread, a look at the week ahead, and it's a very busy one. Outside of moving your clocks forward an hour over the weekend in the United States, Monday we'll have the budget proposal from President Biden, and Tuesday, U.S. CPI plus a 10-year Treasury auction. Wednesday is a 30-year Treasury auction, and Thursday it's PPI and retail sales plus another round of jobless claims. Plus on Friday, University of Michigan sentiment data plus Empire manufacturing data. And for my final thought, a really quick look here at CPI, an expectation of a cooling to 3.7% in core year over year. From New York, that does it from us. Same time, same place next week. This is Bloomberg Real Yields, and this is Bloomberg.